It's so disorienting it being one o'clock. Um, all right, so let's, um, we have Michael Ducey and somebody else said that they could scribe. I heard two yeah. voices. This is Lakshmi, yeah. Super, thank you. Justin Cormack, do you want to check in first? I don't have a lot to report this week. I missed last week's meeting, for, for, so um, yeah, nothing much. All right. Brandon Lum. Hey, um, so I, I looked at Aaron's um, PR again for the clarification identity stuff. I think it was good, just like one or two clarifications needed. Um, if anyone wants to take a look and comment a little bit more, I think besides minor changes, I think it should be good to merge. Super, yeah. you want to include the um, PR in the uh, notes? Yeah, I'll do that as well. Great. I'm next. I um, don't really have much to report either, um, other than I, um, we have all the transcripts and um, Michael, uh, other Mike, Michael, last name I'm spacing on, who's leading the microsite um, group is, uh, um, we were gonna mock up some content and we have a logo. Um, so that uh, went out on Slack. And so I've requested that Amy, uh, that, the, that we get a, uh, the designer to put together like a whole web palette based on the logo, which I think will help with the microsite and lots of, you know, whatever we have to do, we can now have a set of colors and a logo and that's nifty. So, um, so yeah, nothing much in security land. Um, for me, other than, oh, well, something that was pretty interesting is I went to D web camp and learned about a bunch of peer to peer protocols and databases like scuttlebutt and the interplanetary file system. And they're all, and, and, uh, self sovereign identity and different ways that they're using the blockchain to not have to have a um, single identity service. So that was pretty interesting. That's my check-in. Michael Ducey. I have been absent and I apologize for that. I uh, got caught on uh, a trip and then vacation um, and vacation overlapped Wednesdays two weeks in a row. Um, but I'm back and I will be back from here on out. Uh, not too much to report. I saw the email threads around the six security days, so I'll wait until we get to that uh, to talk about that. Um, but WorkRise was at OzCon last week. Um, we have uh, some interesting things um, that we're thinking of with IBM and some work we're, we're doing with them on the open source side. So that's pretty much it for me. Perfect. Emily, you're next. Emily Fox. So I, like Michael, was out at OzCon last week, and um, I emailed Emily Ruff back concerning logistics and some other event-specific information for SIG Security Day. Um, we'll talk more on the agenda later about some of the decisions that we need to make today. That way we can continue to move forward with the event. That's all I have. Great. Thanks, Emily. Gareth. Uh, I, off the back of being new member last time, I took a look at the new member issue and the sort of proposal around that. Um, I uh, left some comments. I, I think that I think ultimately the idea of having a something that is for new members would be really useful. Um, I think I made two main points. I think it's worth having something that is uh, targeting people who are like sig familiar, um, who've been along to strange things like this before. I think it's probably worth having something for people who are like, what even is this? Like, this is weird. Um, I also think it's worth having examples in there. Um, basically like stories of like previous issues that have moved through the process, like how they got picked up, like what the success was. I think that will make it easier to go like, oh yeah, I understand what, how this works. Um, but yeah, I left some comments. I'm happy to uh, pull some things together. If people have specific stories, um, I'm happy to like, 
write something up, but I don't have the individual bits that people have done. Yeah, uh, that's, um, I'm going to put, I'm going to, if we have time before JJ arrives, uh, it'd be neat to, to brainstorm that a little bit, um, or maybe talk about it next week. Because I think it would be neat to have like a little sharing from people who've been around for a little while about like, what did you do when you were new that was helpful? Yep. <laughs> to both to the group and like helped you on board. I think that's a really neat idea. Or right, if people want to include that on the issue, it's like uh, on GitHub, I'm happy to then collect all of those together and make that into a thing. Great. Uh, sounds like the, the, that would go well on a page on the microsite. So happy to chat to Michael. Um, well, the micro the first iteration of the microsite is focused not on the SIG, ah, got but you. on the outputs of the SIG that would let people know more about cloud native security. Excellent. Um, yeah. So maybe just a page in the GitHub repo to start with. Yeah. Can um, actually can you link uh, that issue yep. into the? I just stuck it on the agenda, but maybe. I will. Yeah. I'll, uh, in the chat, I'll put it in the notes as well. Okay. Super. Aaron, uh, yes, as someone who is not a SIG, <clears throat> excuse me, who is not a SIG expert, I would uh, certainly uh, certainly use some of that uh, uh, that guidance. Um, some comments on the issues. Looks like uh, Brandon, I'll respond to your thing, and then uh, hopefully pick, uh, pick something else up. But uh, other than that, have not picked up anything else uh, this week. Thanks, Aaron. Um, Carlos. Oh wait, no, I missed skipped Lakshmi. Is next. Sorry. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry I missed last week. Uh, nothing. Uh, nothing from my side. I just saw that uh, Gareth uh, made some comments on the issue. I'll try to take a look as well. Great. Yeah, some of his comments made sense. Yes. Carlos. Sure. Hi. Uh, Good morning, uh, Jonathan Middens uh, shared with me some ideas about threat modeling. Uh, he developed, uh, well, a good threat model for the Kubernetes. And I'm reviewing and adding uh, some notes on that particular uh, work that uh, Jonathan is uh, developing right now. Uh, I will also uh, finish a couple of tests with uh, some security uh, companies. Uh, related with the Kubernetes project that we are managing internally here at Intel. Um, well, that's pretty much all. Great, thanks. And Lutz. There's Lutz here. You're muted. Lutz, give you a second to get off mute. Maybe we lost you. And then I think I see a couple of people who aren't on the attendee. Ray. Hello, my name is Ray Lahano. I'm actually new to the cloud native and SIG security space. Uh, just seen what the call's about. I'll be over at KubeCon in, in November. And yeah, I'm just saying hi. Great, welcome, TK. Do I see you there? Do you have enough audio to check in? Um, Sorry, I, I was on mute. <laughs> just uh, a little bit late. Um, don't have a whole lot actually just on the um, IEEE 5G roadmap. I um, dug, dug a little bit deeper on that and it seems like uh, um, there are some interesting architectural proposal, which um, obviously identifies security as a very critical component for the 5G infrastructure, which is obviously an integrated uh, system of many, many different architectures. And one of the key points in that architecture that uh, would be interesting to us is the virtualization. So SDN, NFB, inspired virtualization as well as compute virtualization and as well as the storage virtualization they are all playing a very key role and uh, they are obviously uh, focusing on the security that will play a 
uh, pivotal part on the uh, part of the how security is going to be handled in the virtualized world. So that's what seems like on the roadmap, a long roadmap for 10 years. So there's a lot of people getting involved. Many carriers are in there, many vendors are in there. So it's a mixture of everybody, even the end users. Um, so might be worth following that one, which I am doing right now. Great, yeah, it's great to always hear updates from you on that, that group. Sure. Justin, Justin Kapos. Yeah, so um, I've been in Tokyo talking at the Open Source Summit and at the <clears throat> Automotive Grade Linux event there, um, and also meeting with a bunch of the automakers. Uh, they're, they're deploying something uh, that's a variant on the Tough project, that's the CNCF project. Um, and apparently my talk caused quite of a stir because um, there's two different articles, one in LWN, one in an automotive venue that uh, were written based on the talk I gave without anybody talking to me, like interviewing me separately or discussing afterwards um, that I just saw today. So um, yeah, it, it, at least they seem to be getting more security awareness, thankfully. Great. Spreading the word of security all over the globe. Um, Amy, I saw you join the list. But maybe you are, you appear to be unmuted. Uh, is that better? Yes. Oh. I don't know why that works, but hi. Yeah, I'm back from a week of WED. Um, we've got a logo that is finalized, I believe, because I heard no more complaints. Um, and we'll be moving forward on getting that all put in beautiful places and with a color palette and probably some fonts as well. So good fun. Fabulous. Robert, on the phone, if you can. Oh, li uh, listen only, updates below. Further discussion on formal verification plan today on the policy call. So people who are interested in that should join that call. And um, and yeah, Robert, if you could um, share stuff on the Slack um, after the call, uh, that'd be great. Um, so that people can follow along who can't make it to both calls. So appreciate that, you chiming in there. Do we have Santiago here for the supply chain? We're going to chat about the supply chain proposal. Let me just ping him and see if he's joining us. I'll wander by his desk and see if he's around. Well, while we get started. Great. Um, so while we wait to see if that's happening, um, does anybody care, who has been around for a little while care to share a story about how you got involved in this SIG and it, particularly if it's a way that somebody else might, emulate, like, you know, you picked up an issue and you did a thing or you gave a presentation or did something that then contributed to the group and made you feel up like you were a contributing part of it. I'll start. Um, I'm Emily Fox. I work for the National Security Agency, and I got started after listening to Justin Capos' talk at KubeCon Europe and decided that it was really interesting, a lot of the work that they were doing, because it's work that I've done within my own organization, and I thought it would be a great way to contribute back out as one of the things that the NSA can do in the open source community. So I started with looking at a couple of the issues and asking Justin a few questions. I submitted um, a few tickets and then made some pull requests and then 
started commenting on the Think Security Day um, ticket and then got involved in that. That's really how I got started. Thanks, Emily. I also want to point out that, like, because Amy just dove in, uh, Amy, Emily just dove in and made a bunch of um, changes to um, improvements to the uh, guidelines for the security assessments, kind of based on some, I think there was some discussion in the group about things not being clear. And as a new reader, she was able to make those things more clear. And then I noticed that there was inconsistencies across the edits there and edits elsewhere, which led me to know that I should put more things in the style guide. So having a new reader um, make th clarify things like kind of helped us grow the whole, um, you know, our, our process a little better and making, you know, like every time somebody goes through this onboarding, it makes things a little smoother. Are there any questions from new people about what Emily did and, and and things where you might not know to do, do you know what I mean? Like, how did she know to jump in? Maybe I should ask that. Emily, how did you know where to jump in? Um, I have a habit of looking for trouble. Um, just going through and if from, if I don't have the ability to explain it to like somebody in kindergarten or second grade based off of the material that I'm writing, I figure it's always an area for improvement because just because I work in the field and I can understand a lot of things that are going on doesn't necessarily work when we're trying to expand security awareness outside of our field. I work with a lot of developers and system administrators who are more or less completely clueless when it comes to security and how to apply it cloud native architectures. So even just documentation and guidance, which is usually where things are, they leave a lot to be desired. Um, always start there and then just pick something, even if you're completely clueless about it, and just run with it. Because the worst off that you do is you provide support in a documentation kind of capacity and you learn from it. Otherwise, you might find that you have a lot of experience to lend to the group. I think that's super helpful. And I think what I'm hearing is that there are people who are very used to that process of, um, you know, yeah, we expect you to just jump up and do stuff. And there are other people who haven't been in a group where that's the norm. And so there might be places, particularly um, uh, the folks, I think Aaron and Gareth who are chiming in on the new member stuff, there may be places that we've omit, we, we've, we haven't thought to write down like, hey, do this thing that, um, you know, some of us are accustomed to being in this open sourcey world where you just like jump in and do stuff, um, which is, you know, and to some degree, like maybe in contrast with, you know, other groups that people are a part of or other areas, right? Like where maybe not all groups are so much this way, I don't know. Yeah, KubeCon's an interesting proxy for things like that. Um, uh, KubeCon keeps growing, but 70% of uh, people in EU were brand new. They'd never been before. Um, wow. And if you've been to like most of them, it's easy to go like, I see all the same people all the time. Uh, actually, there's way more people just joining the broader community uh, all the time. Yeah. And I think that we aspire to um, support asynchronous communication, right? Like I've, you know, like Howard's super active, yet he's in China. So a lot of it, like he, he helps lead the policy breakout in the afternoon, in my afternoon, um, somebody else's middle of the night. Um, and I think that we want that to thrive, that, that people can be parts of this group and not be present at one meeting because they're in a different time zone and still participate in all the discussions. And, you know, like, likewise for KubeCon. So thanks for mentioning that about KubeCon. I had no idea that it was 70% new people. Fascinating. Does anybody else have a story? I have an interesting tale. Uh, I walked down the hallway and found Santiago, and he's now in my office. Um, oh! So when I, 
ready for that part. Oh, hello. Um, he's ready to talk, but I don't want to interrupt the newcomer story. Oh, well, the newcomer story was waiting for to see whether Santiago was going to join us. Um, but I think we have Santiago and at least Justin Cormack. Unless you had a newcomer story, you were dying to tell Justin Capos. Nope. Okay. Um, so I wanted to give a little space to talk about the supply chain proposal. Um, and I'll actually just share my screen. And because I think we've got two out of the, the, there were a few people who chimed in. But Santiago, do you want to just introduce the concept while I share my screen and bring up the issue? Sure. Uh, so the basic idea is that during the in total uh, security assessment, we uh, realized that there was not a lot of content aggregating information about software supply chain security in general. Uh, this meant that, for example, uh, all of the software supply chain compromises are not uh, somewhere to be like, how to say, uh, verified, or there's no history of like all of the compromises that happen every day that you can just go and look and find. There's also no information about how to like tighten your security release process and like cloud native world and uh, and uh, or references to like academic uh, information that you can like find where like the whole idea came from. So uh, I basically drafted this proposal in which we basically start with aggregating all of this uh, software supply chain compromises for people to query and. Uh, and explore, and uh, hopefully in the future we can uh, expand this to also include like resources on how to tighten your security release process, and uh, and then further into more like a abstract, uh, like a knowledge base of software supply chain security uh, information. Yeah, and I think I also chime in because I think that I just became one of the things that we did with the Intoto assessment is we kind of. Uh, helped clarify the edges of like what Intoto does and doesn't do. And then it raised all of these interest. I remember, you know, like an interesting discussion on like, oh, well, this stuff is outside of the scope of Intoto, but Santiago, you actually know a lot about this. And so, um, sketching out the whole landscape seemed more of a SIG thing and too much to put on the Intoto project. And so it would be like, what, where are there either maybe there are gaps or maybe there's just other things that we want to help point people to, to, to uh, close these gaps. Um, but I also want to leave the floor for other people who chimed on in this issue, who said that they wanted to help to talk about what you envision helping this becoming. Yeah, I mean, I think we, we talked about trying to give people an idea about um, the different kinds of supply chain issues so they could understand how they um, how they feed into the different kinds of things they should be thinking about because I think that people people often just hear the term supply chain compromise and, they, and there's there's actually kind of lots of different kinds of compromise that people don't understand and um, and so generally just um, I'm not, I'm not sure how much a list is actually going to help. I think examples are more helpful because I think maintaining a list is going to be very difficult because it's a rapidly increasing area. But, but um, having concrete examples and pointing to the kinds of issue that cause that and the kinds of mitigations that are available for that kind of issue is, is helpful and, to, and give people background on the on the kind of level of risk there is. And they... Yeah, and Emily, I'm yeah. just bringing up your, since she's on the phone, she can't see, um, this comment that you made about type typecasting attacks, right? That to maybe look at the, path, like draw from that list so that there could be typecasts with examples rather than a time-based list, which would imply that we're gonna like somehow keep it up to date. Which, which yeah, I so I my my worry and, and also like something that I would I kind of think that we we need is the ability to create 
types or categories or classes of supply chain attacks that happen. There's a lot of potential attack vectors within that space that a lot of people just don't even know about or they don't even think about it. Supply chain is probably one of the last things that most people look at, especially if you're um, if you're just working on something small that blows up into a startup. It, Having that listing, or at least a point of reference for people to go to about the kinds of ones that are out there, what they look like, the character traits that make them up, and what the corresponding impact of that looks like. I mean, just thinking about Docker last year and all the crypto mining containers that were found, and we're still finding even libraries doing the same thing. People understand the attacks are happening, but they don't know necessarily how they're getting in or what to look for to prevent it. And that, that's really what needs to happen. Not necessarily a full blown out listing of every single thing that exists, because I don't know that that's humanly possible, but more lumping them together, identifying groups of like objects that we're seeing now and what could potentially come out of that. Uh, I mean, I agree. I don't, I don't think uh, we just need an exhaustive list. Uh, but I think, uh, and I think everybody here is saying that, that we're basically basing off of this uh, incidents drive some insight. So I think in a, in a sense, we do need like a knowledge base that we can build up. And, this is, and that's why I think it would be a good idea to at least have a list that you can just query and go like, hey, all of these things have happened. Uh, and then we can evolve from there and have other documents living in the same space saying, hey, uh, so here's this taxonomy that we came up with and types of attacks, and probably these are some technologies that you should take a look at if you are concerned about this specific uh, attacks on this uh, specific uh, family of uh, problems and so on and so forth. So, so yeah, and I think, I think the, um, I like the idea of having a list to refer to like here's a bunch of examples um and i think that there's there's a way to present the catalog so if it weren't exhaustive it would be fine right it's not like it's a cve database where we need to have a list of every single one that has ever happened right santiago yeah i agree and uh, i think uh I think having like this list, I think it's also good for like people to contribute and go and say, hey, I, I read this article. I think it's a supply chain attack. I'm making a pull request trying to add it to the list and let's discuss about it. Uh, I, think, uh, I think the benefit of having that list makes it so that people can just walk in and have a discussion. Yeah, I like that idea. Like if there's some sort of invitation to contribute to it. Right. Also, if, if I may, I would like to extend this uh, classification idea a bit because um, coming from a, a startup that never has enough resources to even do all the um, understood best practices, um, supply chain management for or software supply chain management definitely is, is a cultural thing because I have to educate my uh, developers. So it would be very helpful to identify even in, a, in the most roughest of, of categories, um, the low-hanging fruit. What, is the, the, what are the first three to five um, things I should protect against? Um, and what are those things that, um, that I should only do in, in order to protect against, um, I don't know, a, a nation state attacker or something like that, which is not, not on my direct threat list? Yeah, absolutely. I think that things like patching Jenkins are very much on, should be on the list because these are things that people are compromised for a lot and, you know, on Jenkins plugins and things like that. These are things that are actually like really common and we can definitely find examples for them and they're very relatable and then not nation state attacks at all. Yeah, I, I agree. I think uh, also we need to think of having this grow a little bit organically uh, in the in the sense that uh, all of those are very, very good ideas. But I think uh, 
we probably want to start with something small and bite-sized and then eventually start growing into a guide that's like a prioritized for like different types of threat models and then have a like a, this uh, type of taxonomy that uh, that also grows and it's discussed about i feel that if we try to go too broad and do everything at once we'll eventually have a a dead project with like half baked ideas and uh, very little value Well, I think at Santiago as the facilitator, um, I think think you have an opportunity and an obligation to um, make the 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 first iteration fit into the scope, right? So we had scoped this as a relatively small first bit, and so I think pulling together the people who like you know after we have this discussion and people give feedback from the wider group, you know, like making best use of the brain power that has volunteered to help to get something within that, you know, relatively small scope that then if there's enthusiasm to do more, then somebody else can take on that initiative and expand it. So I think I, uh, that approach would be very much in keeping with what we've been doing. I think those are very good ideas. Uh, but I, I think it's also, great to like start building hype and have something that we can say hey with it this it's uh, it's out there and then uh, we can go on to the next thing and so on and so forth although some of those ideas inform like what this first catalog would be so i think it's the um you know like having that come out of it and then you can also capture all of the different ideas as potential next steps right yeah i was thinking of ticketizing all of this and saying hey uh all of these things are desirable the community wants them uh and they're like something that we can work towards in the future. Yeah, and I think that like it, we might keep the uh, keep it as notes in the issue, and then break out the tickets after you know where what the the first thing is going to become. Right. Um, are there of uh, in spirit of this discussion? Are there other ideas? ways that you would imagine this might um, come to fruition that would be good? You know, uh, <clears throat> I just listened to this, but uh, it occurs to me that at some point is supply chain protection as well as the tough. And all of these things need to be somewhat transparent at the end to the actual developer, meaning they should be um, intertwined or embedded with the existing or most popular tools that there are. For example, someone mentioned about the Jenkins. Jenkins may have already some protection mechanism <clears throat> as to how the CICD operates and uh, how it uh, protects, for example, all the incoming um, flow and, and the sanctity of it, whether it's hashing mechanism or whatever. Um, so, is our goal going to be at some point that we create a guideline that we can um, publicize and uh, also sell to most of these popular uh, tool providers that basically controls all the development in the world and so that these can be embedded and become ultimately transparent to the developers so that every developer doesn't have to start thinking from the scratch as to how they go about protecting their whole CICD and the whole supply chain mechanism. Is that the... It, it, well, I think it's, it's our habit to, when we recognize improvements that could be made in, in open source things, right, or into vendors where they have an open repository that we generally like write up issues, um, and we did that, you know, in the course of um, the Intoto assessment. And I think it's really um, the first step is to identify all the possibilities. And, um, and then, you know, and then we can move our way through making recommendations. I think this proposal is, it's making the recommendations to improve the situation of supply chain security is one step beyond the current proposal. But I think that if things came out of it, like, oh, this is a common issue that if this part of our ecosystem did X, Y, Z better, like 
writing up an issue with that recommendation, like with that, that observation is a, something that people should just do as a matter of course. Uh, but like we SIG security saying here, we have a recommendation to the cloud native ecosystem about su supply chain stuff, I think is like, let's do the catalog first and whatever comes of that. And then, you know, see if there's, see, you know, what the pacing is on the energy to take it to the next step. I agree in general. I, I'm just wondering, you know, because things are happening quite fast, right? And um, if other people are doing similar type of thoughts and they are already embedding some mechanisms to protect their chain in the CICD pipeline, and we are also proposing something, and then, you know, I, I like to see that the all these efforts come to some sort of a, a real useful uh, you know, end at the point uh, where uh, people are actually using this and not duplicating it or um, proposing, you know, similar or going after the same problem over and over and again. Because I'm so the, sure there well, are so enough problems catalog, to put Basically, the, the proposal came from the fact that this catalog does not exist that any of us could find and currently only exists as a... Mm -hmm. Um, note in the in Toto GitHub re repository, which isn't very visible. And so really this is just a, a relatively small effort to take that this sort of valuable list of supply chain con compromises, right? And then surface it in a more useful way, more broadly by making it part of the SIG security repo or catalog or, or, I mean, it could stay where it is. And I mean, the, the group will, will kind of make us specific recommendations on that. But, but, but also because it has specific relevance to cloud native, that's more that's important. Yeah. Hey, can I propose that we move on in the agenda just so that we have enough time? Yeah, I was just pinging JJ who is not here yet. But um, okay. the let, I want to wrap this and officially turn it from proposal to project with people belonging to it. So um, Santiago is always, are, has already volunteered as a facilitator. Um, and then there are people who've chimed in on the issues who are willing to work on it. And I wanted to just sort of, and I think that we've talked about the scope of this initial effort. So is there any other, um, tweaks to or recommendations about or um, how this might be run as a small project before we um, hand it over to Santiago to kick off that effort. All right, great. Then um, I'll update the issue right after the call. And Santiago, if you would coordinate via Slack or your preferred mechanism and um, facilitate something offline asynchronously or synchronously, however you choose, and then report back. And if it would be helpful to have a, 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 a follow-up during one of the weekly calls, we can do that as well. Okay, sounds good. Fabulous. All right. So I think with or without JJ, we should, um, Emily, I'm gonna hand it over to you to talk about SIG Security Day. Um, so there is, so we're, we're kind of at a decision point with the overall construct of the day. Um, we have a room uh, pre-reserved for about up to 200 people. The question that we need to have an answer on is what kind of format are we going to run? The so last two weeks ago, we had a presentation on unconferences and how those are run, which is not the way that normal conferences are run, where we put out a CFP and get a bunch of talks submitted and we select from there. So right now we need to know if we are running the whole day as an unconference day or a normal conference day, because this will affect room setup and layout. Um, the current proposal um, for layout is a classroom style or a bunch of chairs in rows round table 
distributed throughout the room. This would allow for more collaborative discussion to occur and follows closer to the unconference design. And then uh, the last one is theater style, but I don't know that that's necessarily going to work for us. So I wanted to open it up to the group to find out what everybody's preference is. And actually, what I'd like to propose is that we talk about the format, of, like what we want to, how we want the day to go in this big group. And then I think the small group can figure out the room layout based on what's most effective for the format. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. I think it's just that we have, so, like, we can accommodate the unconference, which we weren't sure about two weeks ago, because we can set right. things up as discussion and there may be you know like in these different ways so we know it's possible so i think we have we just need to narrow it down to three options so we have basically conference style talks all day on conference all day long what my original idea was talks on conference and then a talk at the end as like an anchor talk to kind of keep people around and so um we have 9.15 to 12.15 presentations, the open spaces, and then the anchor presentation, and then we wrap up. I think that's the, I feel like is a good agenda that gives a mix of both for people. And if we do the rounds, it will facilitate the open spaces. Yeah. I, I, just to chip in, like the this sort of format um, has worked really, really well for uh, DevOps Days events. Um, like it tends to be just a good mix of like structure and then like freedom. So I'm good with that. Um, the email that we got from Emily Ruff is that the event needs to run from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. So I'm pretty sure that given uh, Michael's proposal, we can certainly make that work for us and i i personally am a fan of the idea with the round table layout to enable more collaborative discussion especially if we can do more of the unconference session at least part of the day which is part of the one of the original goals was to get the right people together at tables to start having conversations and understanding that security in a cognitive environment is not easy but it's something that needs to be done yeah i think that um i think michael you let like you miss the there's sort of like a, a nuance to the that um Kalia contributed is that the like which i think can happen with whatever format like whatever degree of unconference stuff in it is that people are if ev if the more like if it's if ev like if everything's unconference then people then it then it's more self-generative right everybody comes in with that expectation um, which doesn't mean necessarily that there aren't anchor things. Um, you know, there aren't some prepared presentations. Um, and I think the, I think the big question that we want, what, that we need to resolve today is whether we will have any CFPs. So we could like one of the things that JJ had suggested is doing this format, you know, like like Michael's written down, which now I currently have up on the screen, Emily, by the way, um, that we could do the um, we could have whatever presentations that we choose to do be invited mm -hmm. so that we're not both managing, you know, an, a CFP and managing an unconference thing like that we're the unconference thing doesn't require tons of management on no, it's, it's the, the expectation side. i'm talking about people how people feel in prep preparing for the event if we do a cfp and choose a few like two or three people to present and we have dozens and dozens of people who have prepared a present like you know it, it may change the flavor of the unconference to have a CFP and an unconference. Do you know what I mean? Th that's what I was talking about in terms of mm, expectations. Yeah, I'm. And I'm not sure that I'm we want. Probably just. I'm probably just biased from having done several of these events, running them myself in this format, and participating in a ton of events in this format, and that they tend to work fairly well. 
And what the presentations allow people to do is it's kind of prime the conversation. Um, I would actually prefer to have some form of a CFP just from the perspective of that it causes us all to get out of our own echo chambers and our own areas of bias and try to solicit things from outside our group so that we can pull from uh, uh, resources that we don't necessarily have or we don't see every day or we don't hear from every day. And then the open spaces, the way the open spaces work is more not necessarily that we need to have like prepared so, content or anything. Michael, Michael, I just want to let you know that since you missed last week, we had a half an hour presentation about what open space what is. So uh, Right. So there's many different forms of unconference. So I just want to make sure that we're in agreement with the type of unconference we're talking about in this case. So I think you and Emily can get together with JJ and talk about it in great detail. Um, okay. What I want to make sure that we have the whole, like that we have more space for is the pros and cons of doing a CFP, right? And get feedback on that from the wider group because what right. we heard, and from, so just hang on. We heard from Emily two yeah, weeks I'm ago sure. that if we, so that it was already, all of the CFPs have already gone out for this time frame. It doesn't mean we can't do it. I'm just saying that like the, the amount of time we will have to give, to, to reach out outside of our bubble will be shorter than other um, things happening around KubeCon because of yeah. um, the, uh, this yep. late. Just, we also have the advantage to... of a bunch of people getting rejected yeah. uh, come mid-August that we can pull from as well. Yeah, I, I think the, the numbers play in our favor here. So Barcelona is an example. Um, the the CFP dates for Coupon were even closer than they are for uh, for San Diego. Um, Reject Conf actually ran an entire two days. Um, I think even with multiple talks going on at the same time, uh, populated solely by people who'd been rejected from KubeCon, and they still had a CFP problem where they had like more submissions than they could take. So I think just down to yeah. scale of KubeCon at this point, um, I think if we put up a CFP uh, and we put a deadline on a week, we would still be inundated with submissions. I think uh, we would be inundated with submissions. And I think they would be all the people who normally show up at KubeCon because so I'm just talking about to the diversity point. That's yeah. all. Yeah. And if we want to reach do outreach that requires a longer that will require more effort. Right. And okay. um, because um, if you want to make sure that it's a diverse set of people. Right. You need to as opposed to inviting a specific set of people who are outside of your normal bubble you want to make sure that many of those people submit to your CFP so that you can choose the best options. So I'm just, you know, mixing up the conversation. I'm not saying that I'm not going to be a decider here on this. Okay. I'd like to um, put a call um, out for other I'll... people who haven't spoken to chime in on, you know, to give feedback to the team on CFP. Yes, no, how to do a CFP to make it effective. And Emily Ruff, who's not on the call, will actually be, you know, who's a CNCF staff person, will help us execute on the CM, on the CFP. So this is more to like have people in the group share with Michael and Emily about what your hopes and desires are for this. See, my concern on this uh, whole unconference thing and so forth is that, I mean, it's a great idea for brainstorming. But at the end of the day, you need to have a focus. We must have a focus as far as what we want to achieve. And if we don't have a goal that we at least put forward in front of the audience, I mean, the audience can, obviously, depending on their comments, that can change. I understand that it can evolve. But we need to have something as a focus as to what we want to achieve through the security day and where we are heading, some goal which could change based on the people's input and so forth. But if we don't have anything and just go as a free form, can work probably on the first time, but I don't think it should continue like that. And that's not very, I don't see how that is very productive. So I'm gonna get with Michael 
after the call um, and we'll get JJ and we'll probably have some conversations in the SIG security events group and we'll come to a resolution and then we'll update the ticket with the status. I do have to run right now, so I'll okay. check back in later. Thanks, Emily. And, um, and to TK's point, this is not unstructured, no matter like whether it, we, there is unconference format or not, the ticket has very specific, you know, details around what is, what the, is going to be accomplished. And I think the goal of the day is primarily to bring together people to exchange knowledge and share across what their, their practices are and what they're doing. And with the, and what Emily had said in the, the previous um, breakout was that the, the output would be primarily recordings of the prepared talks and, you know, and then maybe additional notes if people chose to take them, but, um, but that the goal of it was really community building and knowledge sh sharing for the people in the room. I and, think documenting yeah. the outputs of unconference is really, it was really important. Yeah. I think that having something that is not documented at CNCF events is not helpful. People aren't there. And we should definitely yeah. include that. As, yeah, I'm not a fan of doing that. that. But that's very different from saying our goal is together to create a XYZ and at the end we will have that thing. I oh, know, absolutely. No, I, I, I yeah, and I, I, don't, I don't agree that we need to go in with a preconceived outcome. I think having an conference is a way of bringing together people who have to find out what their concerns are and what they want to happen, what, what things are important to them. And we can then determine outcomes at the time, which is, I think is pretty important. Great. All right. So we will wrap, uh, Michael. I, oh, great. Go ahead. I wanted to get two more points of feedback from people real quick. Um, sure. One thing the CNCF suggested is a price of $199. Um, I just, I feel like it's kind of high um, as we're trying to do more of a community oriented event. Does anyone have any point of feedback on that or higher, or lower, keep it as it is, who cares? Looking at maybe you, Gareth or Justin, if you have any, Justin Cormack. Yeah, and yeah, also people should feel free to type in in the chat. But yeah, I would like. Uh, thanks for bringing that up, Michael. I'd love to hear. From uh, um, that. Uh, yeah, I think that's an interesting question. I think if we could uh, at least have some way of making it optional for people who can't afford to pay, that would be good. Okay. Um, yeah, I, there I, are the. I'd be happy for people to come who are not coming to the main event and therefore are not paying. X thousand dollars or whatever it is anyway to come because to make it more accessible if possible. Yeah. I, off the top of my head, that would, I don't remember anything that expensive at Barcelona. Things were, uh, caveat, we managed to crash our currency. So I can't, I can't actually remember the dollars to pounds thing. Um, uh, the CDF event, which was the biggest event in Barcelona, that was roughly 300 people, I think. That was, I, I can't remember if that was free, if memory serves, or, it, well, if it wasn't, it was like $20 equivalent. There were events that okay. were probably more like $120, I caveat currency. Yeah, requiring people to charge at least $50, which I think is primarily around avoiding no-shows. Yeah. And so I think yeah. we can, I'm sure we can say like, hey, if this is a hardship for you, like whatever price they decide, if this would, if the price would cause you not to come, let us know and we'll provide. There is a, yeah. just like a headache problem also with paying something. I know there was some event or something I had wanted to drop by and it wouldn't have been an actual problem to pay for it, but I, I like couldn't logistically go and pay for it to just go and show up. So yeah. I really, okay. we do want to just be able to wander in. Well, I think okay. it, they, uh, well, I think that's a good, 
let's take that as feedback and we'll see how we can logistically make it happen. Yeah, sounds good. That's all I needed. Um, me and Emily will make sure that we update the group next week on this. Thank you, Michael. Thanks everybody. Feel free to um, shout out on Slack. Um, I think there's an events uh, channel if you have follow-up feedback and thoughts after this. All right, cheers. Have a great week, everyone.